60,000 following dovish FOMC comments. Well, welcome back to Gold Seek Radio, everyone. Chris Waltzek with you. Remember the 1970s, the Bee Gees, Saturday Night Fever, Saturday Night Live. At least one of the three is still with us. I can recall sorting through the pocket in search of those elusive silver dimes and quarters. You remember the ones without the red stripe on the edge, hoping to find a 90% or 40% silver coin. It wasn't too difficult back then. I know most of our listeners did the same thing. Silver was trading, you know, 4 or $5 an ounce, if even that. Fast forward to today, a little tougher. One might show up in a few rolls or so from the bank of coins. Economists have a term for the phenomenon, Gresham's Law. Bad money chases out good, or good money, i.e. gold and silver, is pushed out of circulation by worthless coins and paper, like our copper sandwiches or copper-clad dimes and quarters. Now, you know, the concept is easy. Any school kid knows that silver is more valuable than nickel or copper. So pre-65 coins wind up in the dressers and in coin collections or just simply sold on eBay for a tidy profit. But every currency eventually loses its favor, and even copper-clad U.S. coins could soon become a relic of the past. Copper may be too valuable as cheaper money or bad money, such as crypto and digital money, pushes it out of circulation. Now, we're big cryptocurrency fans here, but here's an example. The push in India to an all-digital economy is pushing paper and coins right out of circulation. That temporarily, just in November, and in fact, on the day of the presidential election, sent gold to over $3,600 an ounce for a few days. Could Gresham's Law make digital money the de facto currency leading to an unimaginable inflationary spiral on an unprecedented scale. This week's top financial experts agree something big is brewing. Jim Rogers joins us from his Singapore office with his latest market commentary. Hold on to your crude oil contracts. Black Gold is headed for the stratosphere. He agrees that at any time, as soon as next week, this is the buying opportunity du jour. Jim Rogers finds value in other commodities, such as the base metals. And he's pointing to financial history, noting that three rate hikes spells disaster for equities. Could happen again here in the U.S. And Charles Hughes Smith returns to the show from Of Two Minds. We discuss David Stockman's work on debt as the primary means of economic growth. Look back again at the past. Around the time that Ronald Reagan came into office, we had less than a trillion dollars in debt, about $900 billion. It seems tame today. National debt has increased by about 20-fold since then, and the stock market has increased by 21-fold. Is there a relationship between debt and our amazing stock market rally? And what does that mean for our listeners' portfolios? You'll want to listen to Charles Hughes Smith's comments. And then Robert Ian with another must-hear report. Goldseek.com Radio begins now with a market weather recap. Visibility virtually unlimited over the precious metals market for the sixth week running on a continued sell-off in the U.S. dollar. Investors sold the greenback following dovish comments from the FOMC on Wednesday. Gold added 2.6%, up 31 Twelve twenty an ounce silver picked up thirty four cents two percent ending the week at seventeen fifty. The precious metals XAU though up three points over three percent finishing at ninety two forty four and just when it couldn't get any better, black gold up sixty six cents a percent around fifty four a barrel and the chart is just so bullish. We've been winding up for almost three months. This thing looks like it wants to explode to seventy as far as maybe even 90 to 100 this year. Just a forecast, just an opinion. The top story moving the precious metals Fed noted it would raise rates at a slower pace than expected. That's, of course, good news for the precious metals as they tend to yield lower rates than paper assets. Next week, expect comments from Fed officials, including the more dovish Chicago Fed President Evans and St. Louis Fed President James Bullard, according to a Bloomberg report. In related news on Friday, the World Gold Council showed that global investment demand leaped in 2016, 
over 70% on the year, the highest in four. That was a little surprise in India, where gold spiked to over $3,600 an ounce amid the uh, U.S. presidential election, where they made the announcement, of course, to remove the top currencies from circulation. Folks clamored for gold. Hundreds of millions of Indians rushed to convert soon-to-be-worthless cash into, of course, the only sound money. The price spike was brief in nature. I think the event signifies, you know, the canary in the proverbial mine. There is startling risk in modern economies to currency crises. Prima facie evidence of the need for everyone to accumulate the precious metals post-haste. Adding to the bullish case for the metals, outflows from the gold ETFs in 2013 through 2015 reversed course into monster inflows. In 2016, the second highest on record as investors braced for uncertainty, including Brexit and the threat of further EU disintegration, as well as issues on the Eastern Front and in the Middle East. So it's little surprise to read that the predictions this week from the London Bullion Market Association include an average of 1244 an ounce, ranging as high as 1380 this year. In addition, demand remains insatiable in the rousing Tiger Nation, where approximately 400 million people are anxious to procure the metal, but they simply have no access to it. This represents pent-up demand or potential energy for our physicists in the audience, adding to upward momentum plans by the new administration to boost infrastructure spending kept many investors anxious to pick up discounted metals, including lead, palladium, copper, and then gold and silver. Moreover, mining shares remain red hot. They never really succumbed to the pullback that we saw in the underlying metals, thanks to the strongest U.S. equities rally in decades. There's also comments from Rob Lutz, Chief Investment Officer of Cabot Wealth Management. He says he's buying stocks because he knows they'll adjust to inflation. But with inflation in the background, gold prices will clear, quote, $2,000 an ounce in just two to four years. Evidently, investors agree with his thoughts. On Wednesday, $413 trillion had poured into the Spider Gold ETF, recouping most of recent outflows. Precious metals, bottom line. The big news here, of course, the XAU gold ratio continues to remain super strong. It had every chance to roll over this week, but instead closed near the highs. I see this as a classic sign of, of bull market activity when the bears have every chance to cap the price, but the indexes keep inching higher as the world's greatest self-made trader said never short a dull market as long as the xau remains above weekly support in the 50 and 200 moving average gold and silver could continue to make a stealth rally at any time sending the yellow metal north of 1300 and silver 1920 moving on to the wall street report mostly sunny skies appeared over the new york stock exchange as investors proved that last week's major milestone wasn't just a flash in the pan the dow jones was knocked back but then roared to life like the Phoenix, closing above 20,000 for the second consecutive week. By Friday's close, the Dow finished near break-even, off only fractionally by 22 points, finishing at 20,071. The S&P picked up three, ending at 2297 for the week, while the Nasdaq added six, finishing at 5667. The top story driving equities news that Fed policymakers held rates on Wednesday's FOMC meeting indicates a near Goldilocks-like scenario where the economy is not too hot or too cold. It's just right for investors who are shunning debt in pursuit of higher returns. The Fed indicated lowered concerns over inflation amid weaker-than-expected wage growth. According to the U.S. Labor Department report, domestic employers created 227,000 new jobs in January. That was the best in four months. Nevertheless, the national unemployment rate climbed to 4.8 percent as average wages increased at a lower percent, suggesting that inflation is subdued making a lowered case for further rate hikes. Bottom line on equities. Well, the technical picture remains bullish for the sector, with the fear and greed index still in neutral territory despite record highs. Although investors did initially sell stocks this week, share prices roared back, closing near the weekly highs. I expect even better prices in the coming weeks. Coming up after the break, more Gold Seek Radio with two big guests and Robert Ian. We'd like for you to stay with us. Charles Hughes Smith from the blog of twominds.com returns to the show 
with some very interesting recent topicality that I know our listeners are going to like. Welcome back, Charles Hughes Smith. Thank you, Chris. Always a pleasure to be on your program. Well, it's great to have you back and, you know, give people an overview. Well, Chris, I guess we can start by saying that I think I received two educations at once because I worked my way through college uh, doing um, working for construction firms, you know, for remodelers and builders. So I, I learned the quite a bit about the trades while I was getting a degree in philosophy. But the one good thing about philosophy is it does teach you to read things critically and to try to parse out, like, what are the key ideas here and what are the key assumptions being made about those ideas? And so that served me well when I moved from uh, building and remodeling into writing about housing and then the housing bubble and then all the financial aspects that I learned about, you know, as to how the housing bubble in, in, in the 2000s came about. And then that kind of led naturally into, well, where are all these economic and social trends taking us as we go forward? You know, like we didn't really solve uh, the, all the causes of that bubble. And now, you know, a lot of us feel that we're in another series of bubbles. <laughs> So it's a fascinating time to be alive, what with the Internet and share a lot more ideas than we used to back when you had a small a number of gatekeepers, you know, that there were three TV networks and a handful of major newspapers. And um, so now it's a, it's, a, it's a bit more of a free-for-all, but we have a broader range of ideas out there as a result. I'd like to talk about the Dow Jones, uh, as you know, last week, the big milestone, 20,000. Yeah, it seems like just about a decade or two ago, we were around 10,000 or 11,000 on the Dow. So some folks are questioning, is this a debt-based uh, rally that has occurred in the U.S. equities markets, the financial institutions, uh, widespread access from our central banks, of a massive, you could even say trillions, certainly billions of dollars um, where they could buy up you know their own shares many of these institutions and corporations using very inexpensive debt the term here of course our listeners know are buybacks you know these debt levels might have peaked that maybe uh, we've just taken on about as much debt as possible you know give us an idea of the implications of all of this debt for the u.s economy well, that's a big topic. The chart that you're referring to, maybe we can start with that, which is a, a chart from Societe Generale, the French bank, which shows corporate buybacks and the amount of, of change in corporate debt. And of course, we're not surprised to see that as corporations borrow a lot of money, they, they increase their buybacks of their own shares, which then boosts the value of, of the remaining shares. And it's a classic uh, way of extracting wealth from the company um, if you're a manager um, or, you know, in, in, in the uh, high ownership. Because as your shares go up in value, it's based not on generating more revenues or more profits. It's simply based on reducing the number of shares by increasing the corporation's debt. <laughs> So, and of course, debt does have a cost. It's called interest. And even at low rates, eventually, you know, it takes away, uh, it subtracts from your, from your revenues because you've got to pay the, the uh, interest on the debt you borrowed to boost your own personal wealth. <laughs> so, and it does look like um, that uh, corporate debt and buybacks have topped out and at uh, very similar levels to the um, 2007, 2008 um, peak, which of course was followed by um, the global financial crisis. And so that's one aspect of debt, right? Corporate debt. And of course, we, we know that um, to the best of our knowledge, there's enormous levels of corporate debt in Europe and Japan and, and in China as well. So this is not just isolated to the United States, right? I mean, it's a global phenomenon. We also know that sovereign debt soaring, right? Because all these, uh, every government is funding. Um, its uh, programs and expenses with, with, um, by selling more bonds, i.e., you know, borrowing more money from future taxpayers. And then we've got personal debt, right, um, and shadow banking debt. And so, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it does raise a key question, um, Chris, which is what is the collateral underlying all this expansion of debt? In other words, what is it based on? And in theory, uh, it's based in, on the corporate level on, on higher earnings and higher profits, right? In other words, that's your income stream is, is, is expanding, and therefore you can afford more debt. Similar to a household that sees um, real earnings 
um, expansion. You know, they're making more money every year than they can afford to borrow more money. But we're not we're not so sure that that real net earnings are in fact rising either for households or or corporations. And so the suspicion is that this debt is is actually being um, expanding a narrowing base of actual collateral, um, and whether that's real real um, tangible collateral such as precious metals or um, productive you know land or real estate, or if it's um, the collateral of of earnings, and in both cases, we're, we're, we're many of us are suspicious of this that there's an expansion of collateral to match the expansion of debt. I'd like to point out some interesting uh, facts here. I mean, give folks some perspective. David Stockman, I think, does a fantastic job showing how the Dow has been filled. You know, our Dow Jones Industrials twenty years or so. Actually, it's closer to thirty years on just how much debt fueled this uh, astounding advance, and it's it's nearly one to one ratio. If you take a look at his numbers, he shows the Dow Jones is up roughly twenty fold, and U.S. debt is up to about twenty two fold. So there's a you've got a very close correlation there. I know our listeners know by now we have about twenty trillion in national debt, which has doubled over the last several years back to 1981. Ronald Reagan is in office. We have less than $1 trillion, about $951 billion in total national debt. Uh, this is hard to even wrap one's mind around. We are not haven't even used the T word yet. We're back on B. And then, boom, we start to skyrocket in through the Bill Clinton years into the end of the 1990s, and then it really takes off. We're approaching exponential growth here in debt. Some folks are saying that uh, the current administration Administration will have to bump things up to as high as, let's say, $30 trillion in order to maintain the status quo that we've enjoyed, I guess, some people, maybe a very slight fraction of our populace has enjoyed. Do you care to give people more perspective on the risks here associated with this debt? It's an excellent question, and, and I have a chart here on the blog today um, of the global bond market, which, of course, is just another term for at the debt market, right? Because you sell a bond, and and that's that becomes a, a debt. And so, uh, kind of mirroring the uh, statistics you you uh, mentioned from David Stockman's site, uh, this chart shows that global bond market, the emerging markets, the developed uh, markets, other than the U.S., like Europe and Japan, and then the the United States, there was about ten uh, trillion in outstanding bonds. I mean, private, public, everything. 1990, and now it's um, pushing 100 trillion. It's almost to 100. So it's gone up tenfold since the early 90s. So um, that you know, we have to wonder: did did the collateral and the income stream rise tenfold, or, or uh, to to support that? I think one of the dangers that I'm looking at is. Where is the um, revenue and profit stream coming from that's going to um, be able to, um, you know, service this enormous increase in debt? And I, I tend to think that the um, the global corporations that they're uh, they've they've shown strong revenue and profit growth over the last you know 15 years, and now we see if you look at, at uh, corporate profits, you see that they're they're flatlined, they're sort of stagnant, they're 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 down. Um, or maybe they're up a tiny bit, but they're no longer climbing in a straight line like they were all through the 90s and, and, and uh, much of the 21st century. And so we can ask, well, why is that? And, and of course, we all know the answers. You know, globalization is already um, everybody that was uh, that made a fortune by moving the factory from the U.S. overseas. That's all been done. Now labor costs are rising in China and the rest of Southeast Asia. That old debt that used to be, say, at seven or eight percent, and then refinancing it at you know a much lower rate rate, two, three, four percent. That's all been done, right? And now we see global um, interest rates clicking higher along with global inflation. So it's as we put these together, we go, everybody's borrowing more money, but actual net income, both for households and for corporations, is stagnant. So that's a problem, right? <laughs> I mean, if you're going to keep, keep borrowing uh, a lot of money and yet your, your income stream is, is stagnant or declining, then eventually you're going to reach a point where you can't service that debt. You can no longer make the payments, and um, then we get a, a global financial crisis. And, and where it's going to come from, well, that's, um, that's the question. And um, 
crises tend to not repeat themselves. In other words, if the crisis came from um, subprime mortgages in 2008, we're probably not going to get that same um, source of the crisis. It'll be somewhere else. You know, it'll come from another part of the financial global financial system that is um, just as fragile, just as over leveraged as the subprime mortgage uh, sector was in 2008. You're essentially mirroring the uh, comments of uh, some of our guests here in the past, including Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff, a top economist, Boston University. He has pointed out this nonsense of $20 trillion in debt. You really need to at least take that number, multiply it by 10. His numbers range anywhere from $200 $200 trillion to $220 trillion in total national debt. And, of course, it's just unsustainable. We're looking at debt that is growing at a phenomenal pace far beyond our gross domestic product. That's where you start to get into trouble. And we can simplify it if you have a household and you are taking on lines of credit and maxing out your credit cards and student loans, car loans, you name it, but your income is stagnant or even declining. Give us an idea of the economic fallout we're facing. Many of us who um, are considered rogue or, say, let's just call it unconventional (laughs) economists or or observers, we all know there's going to be a crunch time when this debt that's unpayable is going to be either written off, like it has to be written down, and the people holding that debt as, as an asset have to absorb the loss, or the money that we use, our currency, has to be depreciated so uh, to such a degree that that the debtors, both nations and, and households and, co- and companies, will be able to service the debt because they're using money that's lost. And of course, there aren't a lot of other tricks to deal with this. And so that's why many of us, uh, we see, we look ahead and we'll go, either you, you've got to accept, um, grasp the nettle, in other words, accept the reality that this debt's never going to be paid back and the debt has to be written off, which is what happens in bankruptcy, right? That, that uh, say, a household goes bankrupt, then it's basically a, an acceptance of, of everybody involved that the household can't pay this debt back, they can't make the interest payments, and so it's going to have to be renegotiated and the bank or the, the lenders are going to have to absorb the loss. They're never going to get the money back. And, and this, of course, is painful, especially for people that... Own, that own the debt, right, that, that thought that was an asset. Or you, you mess with your currency, which, um, as, we've, as many of your guests have pointed out, this is one of, um, uh, one of the favorites throughout history is for governments to um, devalue their currency as a way of, of keeping the illusion alive that the whole system is solvent. But it's actually insolvent. And so the losses are taken through the currency. But this is a disaster for national economies, and this is why most countries that try this end up collapsing, is you're, you're taking away the purchasing power of everyone who holds your currency. And that includes your citizens, it includes um, overseas investors, it wipes out everybody instead of just wiping out the bad debt. And so I think the best way to clear you know, a debt overhang or a debt that's, that's unpayable or so-called bad debt is to come out of the pocket of the people who um, are directly owning of that debt. In other words, if the bank holds a, a bond or a mortgage that's not going to get paid, the bank has to accept the losses. And of course, that's what should have happened in 2008 in the global financial crisis. But the banks had gained so much political power and had become so integral to the economy that the politicians were fearful of forcing the banks into insolvency. So they bailed them out. And so uh, that creates a problem because we didn't get rid of the bad debt, and now it's become a systemic risk. And that, in other words, the risk has now been spread to all of us. For those of us that look at places like Venezuela, where they've um, heavily de- you know, devalued their currency as the so-called solution, it's impoverished the whole nation. And, and that's a tragedy, but that's, that's what you get if you don't deal with it up front. But at the heart of it is a lack of understanding of inflation and the ramifications of tinkering with your currency in that way. And at last check, and by now it's probably gone even higher. This was several weeks ago. But, I mean, they had removed a couple of their boulevards out of circulation. And it seemed like the 20,000 bolivar. And, of course, we're also seeing currency issues in India. Uh, I mean, this is an, an enormous nation now. I mean, with essentially a billion plus 
has essentially shut the entire economy down in this push to go digital. And there's a lot of talk that this could uh, gain momentum, that this might just be the, um, you know, the petri dish for the elite, for the powers that be, who wish to have total control over every transaction in an economy. If you're really being above board, you would never have any need for that outdated relic of the past, you know, paper currency. That limits freedom. And so it looks great theoretically, but empirically, we run into some big issues when every single transaction is transparent. My kind of approach is to, to look at it as a, as a financial or a aspect, but also as a cultural aspect. And so what we find is that the smaller Scandinavian countries, uh, you know, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, they're largely uh, digital now. In other words, they, the people there don't have the same um, sense that um, cash is a protection against uh, government um, abuse. And it kind of, I think, relates to the fact that these are small countries with, you know, five or six million people in the case of Denmark or 14 million in Sweden. I mean, basically a large U.S. <laughs> and so they have a much um, higher level of trust in their social contract, you know, in other words, they trust their government, their, their governments tend to be very, have very low levels of corruption. And so they, they can kind of get away with a digital, uh, by switching to digital, because it does save money, you know, in other words, having to deal with cash um, as a store owner, it adds expense, because you've got to deal with all this stuff, it creates a theft um, risk, where if you're just sliding debit cards, there's no cash for anybody to steal, and it, it's a quicker transaction. So there are some advantages to digital, you know, only, but that's unique to those countries that with very high trust levels in there. Many of us fear the government because we largely controlled by private interests who are vested and, and self-serving, and so we are um, fearful that the government's not going to uh, take action to protect the, the best interests of the, but that they'll take action to protect the um, the elites who own um, the assets and political power. So that's why our trust level in our government and our social contract is is much lower. And so if you look at Japan, cash is king in Japan. They would have a very severe uh, social disorder if they tried to ban cash in Japan because. The Japanese just culturally are, are extremely attached to cash. And so those of us that live in countries where we feel our social contract with our government is fraying because of huge inequalities of wealth and power, then we're fearful of, of losing cash, total control by, by the government, which is itself controlled by vested interests. So that's kind of the chain I see. And that um, we're, all for, we're all for ending corruption and we're all for um, reducing costs of transactions, but we would need to have higher level of trust in our government and in our social contract before we could let go of cash like the Scandinavians. This is maybe an even more insidious problem. Gresham's Law, as money is debased, you start to find that things with value begin to disappear. Silver coins from circulation. You know, 10, 20 years ago, you, any handful of coins from the local pharmacy, if you will, or from Walmart, Kmart, you could easily find a silver dime or silver quarter. Good luck today. They've been picked out of circulation for the most part. I see what appears to be, and, and I'm not the first to mention this, we've had guests on the show that have talked about this, an invisible net to sort of encircling the whole nation or even the world itself financially. We're seeing a transition away now from, of course, cash and bills, if you will, as well as plastic even, into this, this pseudo-digital world. If, you know, those worthless, hollowed-out coins that we have that have no precious metals in them at all, maybe a little bit of copper sandwich, even they have more value. So you see Gresham's Law pushing us further, I think, now into a digital realm. And that's where things could really get frightening, because if we entered a situation where the power was cut off, you know, a Katrina-like situation, but more widespread, or a banking holiday, yes, they have happened. We've seen them on the East Coast during recent storms, uh, tropical storms, and we've seen them in the Gulf of the United States following hurricanes. And I'd like your thoughts on uh, just how might society react to the inability to buy and sell and, and to move one's wealth. How I would contextualize 
contextualize your question, which is, a, which is an excellent one, is how do we deal with the fact that governments and central banks can change the rules on us overnight? In other words, we're told, oh, well, this is stable and this is um, forever and this is a permanent system. And then, um, bang, you know, there's a bit of a crisis somewhere and then suddenly the rules are all changed <laughs> overnight, right? And uh, the rules are typically changed to protect the interests of those at the very top of the wealth power pyramid, and then the rest of us just have to deal with it and, and absorb the losses, right? So, for instance, um, in the last financial crisis, there was a um, mark to market, which was a mechanism where, uh, which created some discipline in the market because the actual market value was, was, was transparently found or identified every day. And then that was wiped out, and, and so banks could then um, make uh, absurd claims as to the value of their assets, right? So, and that's never been restored. So instead of transparency, we have this sort of obscure system that protects uh, banks. And tiny example, but there's many other examples, such as as you mentioned in um, in India, oh well, that that, that currency is going to expire and be worthless. Um, and uh, so, how do we deal with the potential for the rules changing overnight? And um, one of the ones that, that worries me and other people too is the the possibility that your IRA money could, you know, some percentage of it or all of it could be um, transferred into government bonds um, under the guise of of protecting us quote, unquote, um, from risky investments, right? <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff that, that is, people are talking about because we see that when, when crisis occurs, the government, um, governments can do a lot of wild and crazy stuff uh, without really thinking through the unintended consequences of this, like, you know, eliminating all, all, all uh, large cash bills. And, and I wanted to also mentioned this is why cash is retaining its value, especially the U.S. currency. Uh, in other words, like um, as you said about Gresham's law, good you know, um, bad money drives out good, right? And so what what the U.S. currency, because it's considered generally trustworthy as a, as a currency, it's it's good around the world. So in terms of like you know, you say good and bad currency. If you have a hundred dollar bill in Laos or Bolivia. Or um, uh, you know Botswana, wherever you are, that is money because everyone recognizes that 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 that's American currency and it's it's going to be able to be converted into something else of value or it's you, you can use it to buy goods and services, and the same can't be said of of most of the other world's currencies. And so this is one of the reasons why I I've been a a, a bit of a not if a dollar bull in the sense that the dollar is likely to continue holding its value because every other currency is even more at risk of being devalued. But the only problem is ultimately, you know, even for the precious metals crowd, this will, you know, have very serious implications. But I mean, there is just no easy way. Once, you know, they open up Pandora's box and they allow this easy money uh, fiat system to take over. History has shown us what happens. But then we've never seen it on a global basis, which we have today. You know, maybe that would be a great place to wrap up today's discussion when the music stops this financial system, there'll be a day of reckoning. Tell us just what, you know, what might happen. I would start by looking at what um, the, the trick that the global central banks have played for the last you know, eight years is to lower interest rates so that more people and companies and, and nations can borrow more money, but it costs them less because the interest rate is, instead of being 6%, it's, uh, it's 1% or a half a percent. And so this has um, enabled the music to go on, right? That this is the this is the trick that's been um, kept the system afloat and allowed this enormous expansion. Is the, the interest rates keep dropping? So if you can't sell a car, for example, at seven point nine percent interest, well, how about one point nine percent? Well, that makes a huge difference in the monthly payment. You can sell a lot more cars at one point nine percent, and the same is true of mortgages. And, and and so, but now that that whole trick is is kind of run out of steam. There's diminishing returns on that. In other words, now interest rates are clicking higher because we've flooded the world economy with all this cheap credit, and so there's asset bubbles. Everything's rising in price, and so we're not going to be able to play that trick for another eight years. And and that's why we're talking about the music's going to stop, and there's going to be some reset. Is because this trick 
has run out of steam, right? You can't drop interest rates to negative 5% when inflation's running at 5%, right? I mean, you, your, your money is going to lose its value. So the question is, what are the central banks and central governments going to do to save the day? As we've been saying, they can't lower interest rates anymore. That's not going to fly. So what are they, what are they going to do? And so they can print money or create money digitally and, and send it to us all, you know, like we this, the, the Federal Reserve could could create a trillion dollars um, with a keystroke and send us each a thousand dollars to to help us pay our our debts, right? To keep us afloat. Um, but is that really a is that really a positive solution? It's just kind of like uh, three card Monty, right? The the Federal Reserve is simply shifting the 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 P and uh, around the cups, right? <laughs> we haven't really resolved the bad debt issue, or it, you can destroy your currency and and wipe everybody out, and so. I'm not sure which strategy they're going to pick, but they both um, are not really solutions. They're just another trick to try to keep the thing afloat. And so it goes back to um, income, like productive assets that generated in whatever the reset is, whether they wipe out our currency or whether the debt system collapses and there's bank holidays and 90% depreciation of all financial assets or however it's going to play out. The key for all of us as individuals and households is to make sure we own, without any debt, we own actual collateral, you know, stuff that has value um, regardless of the currency um, situation or regardless of the overall economy, because those assets will um, will quickly find a, a, a correct market value after the reset, right? So I, I'm, I hope that answer isn't too convoluted, but one way or another, all the bad debt's going to be um, liquidated. It's going to be written down either directly or through a currency devaluation that wipes out everybody holding, you know, financial assets in currency. So, you know, you want to own an orchard. Guess what? No matter what happens to the, the, the currency, it's wiped out after the reset, and people still need to eat, and, and you can sell it or barter it. And so that's going to retain its value. So that's where I'm, I'm focusing is, is real collateral, real income streams, because that'll survive the reset. Something with substance, something where you can crystallize the wealth that you've accumulated, if you've managed to even do so. You know, I mean, according to uh, several bloggers and websites, not to mention St. Louis Fed, very few people in this country on a uh, large scale basis can claim to have even $1,000 in savings were an emergency to emerge without having to use debt or turn to lenders. Makes one wonder whether or not we have the resources to even prepare as a society now, which maybe is a topic for another day. Why don't you tell people more about the uh, services you provide and, and more importantly, the must-read material uh, that folks can find at the Of Two Minds website? Well, thank you, Chris. I uh, would invite everybody to take a look at the first uh, chapters of my book, A Radically Beneficial World, Automation, Technology, and Creating Jobs for All. Um, that you can find on of2minds.com, uh, my most recent major book. So that, that's kind of where my thinking is, and I invite you to read the free parts of the book and look at my extensive archives. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. It's been my pleasure. The gold and silver mining sector is red hot. Every investment portfolio needs precious metal shares. Goldseek.com's top stock analysts have done it again, identifying the next solid gold nugget opportunity, Brazil Resources. Based in the eighth largest economy with a mining-friendly reputation, almost 10 million ounces of gold reserves. Industry insiders are accumulating shares of Brazil resources. The notable management team includes Chairman Amir Adnani, a rising star in the mining industry with a reputation for moving projects rapidly into production. Fortune magazine lists Chairman Adnani in the prestigious list of 40 under 40 ones to walk. Watch. Plus, shareholders benefit from the insights and backing of enigmatic Brazilian billionaire Mario Garnero, CEO of Brazil Invest Group, the nation's foremost merchant and investment bank and founding director. Their Sao George project is 100% owned with paved highway access, a nearby workforce, and a hydroelectric power source near the major gold deposits. Their next top project includes three deposits identified by major gold producers, plus 
plus their RIA project, which is a joint venture with Arriva, benefits from a $10 million treasure map in the hottest address for uranium production in Canada. But the story gets even more exciting with their Whistler project offering geographic diversification in South Central Alaska. To find out more about this unique opportunity, please direct your web browsers to brazilresources.com at Yahoo Finance, ticker symbol B-R-I dot V. Remember to ride the exciting gold stock run of 2016 and beyond. Your portfolio will thank you for adding shares of Brazil Resources. Gold Seek employees may or may not own shares. Nothing contained herein should be construed as investment advice. Jim Rogers, financial author, commentator, hedge fund manager, co-founder of Quantum Fund, and author of several bestsellers back with us today from his office way around the world in Singapore. Welcome back, Jim Rogers. I am delighted to be here. You know, last year, red hot start, it fizzled out by the end of 2016. Now we're off to a, a better start again, and the XAU held up much better than bullion. Uh, do you like the shares? Corrections and rallies are very common in all markets. It doesn't matter what the market and what we're seeing is the process of gold trying to find its bottom. And in my view, it's not here yet. That's fair enough. Tell me your thoughts then on the uh, oil market. I understand you've gotten a bit bullish on crude. Like us, you're looking for maybe 60, 70 a barrel at least on black gold. Eventually, yes, uh, if not higher. My view is more that oil is making its bottom too. It's a complicated bottom. I don't think we've seen the low for this year yet, and I'm not even sure what the low will be. But, you know, a, a range of 30 to 60 or 40 to, to 60, something like that, I don't know. But it is making its bottom. And in 2000, you know, in two or three years, we'll look back and say in 2015, 2016, 2017, oil made energy and oil made, made the bottom. And now we're off to the races. Before it's over, it's going to be much, much higher because the world's known reserves of oil continue to decline, except for fracking. But fracking is, is a little bit suspect now, since people realize it's not just a, a, a simple gold mine. Exactly. A lot of grassroots backlash. People disappointed with all of a sudden, uh, you know, that rotten egg smell and what was formerly a very clean aquifer. It's, it's provided a lot of jobs for the Midwest, but as you say, is uh, seems to be fading. The CRB index, clearly black gold seemed to move almost in lockstep, at least in recent years. Looks like the CRB's put in a bottom. Is that another positive sign for the sector? Yes, the commodities are making, especially agriculture. We've discussed oil. Base metals are certainly in the process of making a bottom. Had a big drop, having a rally, have had a rally. They, too, are making a bottom. And, yes, I'm sure we're all going to look back in a few years and say, Gosh, what a great opportunity that was. You've also kept a very close eye on U.S. stocks. It really surprised almost everyone that we talked here, almost every pundit on the show. The presidential rally, I guess they're calling it. Do you think this was just an anomaly? Was this just maybe a relief rally? A, will the Fed undo it with higher rates this year? Well, higher rates are definitely coming from the market and from the Fed. But whether that undoes the market or not, we'll, we'll see. I suspect it will. You know, his, traditionally, when the Fed raises rates three times, you should be very, very worried. And on the fourth, you should not be worried. You should just run for the hills. So if history is any guide, yes, when the Fed raises rates some more, you'll see uh, more problems in the in the equity markets. Well, what would be the go-to asset? I mean, clearly, our treasuries have been abysmal here uh, with very few signs of life, even on the recent bounce. If equities lose favor, will people maybe turn to um, commodities or will they look offshore for uh, you know emerging markets? One thing one could look to would be U.S. dollars. Cash It's hated right now because it earns nothing. I'm very, very bullish on the U.S. dollar for a variety of reasons. One can look offshore. I'm optimistic about the Russian market, although people are starting to discover it now. We've discussed that before. Uh, there are other markets offshore where one can conceivably find opportunities. Well, U.S. dollars is probably one of the best opportunities around right now because uh, there's going to be a lot of turmoil. And in times of turmoil, people look for a safe haven. 
the world thinks the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. It's not. The U.S. is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, and things are getting worse. But people don't know what else to do, so they'll put in U.S. dollars, which is one reason I own a lot of U.S. dollars. Yes, you were one of the few on our show to catch that. Harry S. Dent Jr. as well as Bob Hoy were along with you because the U.S. dollar put a convincing technical bottom in place uh, last week. This might be a time for our folks with near-term uh, trading perspectives to pick up the greenback or UUP, the ticker ETF. With China celebrating its new year, the rooster, year of the rooster this year, do you see any opportunities there? Well, there certainly China was certainly slow, partly because its customers are slowing. Some parts of the Chinese economy also have a lot of debt, which is going to cause problems in China. China hasn't had much debt for several decades for historical reasons, but now you're going to see bankruptcies, which are going to shock a lot of people. Having said all that, I'm not buying China at the moment. I own plenty of China. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just watching because I have not figured out what uh, Donald Trump is going to do. He keeps saying he's going to, the Chinese, he's going to hit them very, very hard. Trade wars have always been disastrous for everybody. Trade wars have, nobody's ever won a trade war, and trade wars have always led to bankruptcies. So what? Mr. Trump doesn't seem to care about all of that, or, or he thinks he's smarter than history. So I'm watching uh, to see what Trump does before I do anything else in China. And there is some talk about, um, I believe, levying high import taxes and, and whatnot to try to boost our exports, but you seem to think that might backfire? Always has. It's never worked. One of the lessons of history, perhaps the main lesson of history, is that very few people learn the lessons of history. And even the ones who know the lessons of history think they're smarter in history. It'll be different this time. Trump thinks he's, if he understands history, he thinks he's smarter than history. No, exactly. George Santiana said it well. You know, we've got to learn it or we repeat those lessons. And here's a lesson then. Debt, 20 trillion with a T. Two presidential terms, net from 10 trillion to 20 trillion. There's some talk that we may see 30 trillion before the first term. How does that impact your outlook on a longer term basis for commodities and the precious metals? I mean, typically, don't we see spectacular growth when that type of debt is uh, tacked on and the Fed's debt, too? Well, if we do have that kind of debt to growth, then yes, you're certainly going to see a lot more demand, and demand obviously leads to higher prices of real assets and real goods. It'll also lead to higher interest rates as well. Now, you can have bull markets with higher interest rates, at least for a while. That, too, history shows. So we, we can have it, sure. When the debt was $10 trillion, many people said, gosh, $10 trillion, that's, that's a nightmare. Now it's 20 and the, the market's making all-time highs. So why not 30? Why not 40? The point, of course, though, is that somewhere along the line, somebody's going to have to print a lot more money in order to get there. We went from 10 to 20 with a lot of money printing. So with more money printing, sure. Do you expect then uh, to see a situation like we've seen in India, you know, with Prime Minister Modi uh, gutting the economy, bringing everything to a screeching halt simply by declaring we're going to go to a digital currency? Is that keeping you up at night or do you see opportunity there? It's certainly troubling. I'm not sure what, what one can do about it if the whole world eliminates cash and, and everything is digital. That's what governments would love, because if there's dig only digital money, they can control our lives much, much easier and much better. That's not good for the world. That's not good for you and me. It may be good for a few politicians, but it's certainly troubling. Is it keeping it up at night? No. I have not yet figured out a way to uh, circumvent it if and when it happens. Perhaps gold coins, but... Even then, demand for gold coins will probably decline because what can you do with them? You can't really sell them. I guess you can sell them, but even then, everybody knows what you're doing. By the way, if you can figure out the refuge, please let me know. I'm, I'm trying to grapple with it like everybody else. Exactly. Well, maybe a, a silver or gold-backed cryptocurrency. My guess is, though, you'd still agree that it's an excellent safe haven. Even if it's not ideal or perfect, uh, it eclipses much of the you know alternatives we have today. What do you have? You have the bank? You're, you're right. There are not many alternatives. Farms are a good alternative, but they're not very liquid. Food products are great alternatives if you, if you know how to buy and sell them. But you're right. There are not many alternatives. Any new book that you're working on or any plans for the next bestseller? No, no, I, I'm not doing any, any more, any books. It's certainly not at the moment anyway. There's a lady in China who's writing a book about me, but it'll be in Chinese, so it won't be much use to, to, to many people on your show. Uh, if I do something, I'll let you know. Very good. Can you give us a hint on, on any topic that, that's caught your attention? My guess it would be the opportunity in uh, either Asia or Russia. 
continuing. I mean, Russian government bonds right now have very, very high yields. I'm optimistic about the future of Russia. Mr. Trump seems to like Russia a lot uh, or, or dislike them less than many other people. So he's sure that buy Russian government bonds. Jim Rogers, we appreciate your thoughts. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye. The gold and silver mining sector is red hot. Every investment portfolio needs precious metal shares. Goldseek.com's top stock analysts have done it again, identifying the next solid gold nugget opportunity, Brazil Resources. Based in the eighth largest economy with a mining-friendly reputation, almost 10 million ounces of gold reserves. Industry insiders are accumulating shares of Brazil Resources. The notable management team includes Chairman Amir Adnani, a rising star in the mining industry with a reputation for moving projects rapidly into production. Fortune Magazine lists Chairman Adnani in the prestigious list of 40 under 40 ones to watch. Plus, shareholders benefit from the insights and backing of enigmatic Brazilian billionaire Mario Garnero, CEO of Brazil Invest Group, the nation's foremost merchant and investment bank and founding director. Their Sao George project is 100% owned with paved highway access, a nearby workforce, and a hydroelectric power source near the major gold deposits. Their next top project includes three deposits identified by major gold producers, plus their RIA project, which is a joint venture with Arriva, benefits from a $10 million treasure map in the hottest address for uranium production in Canada. But the story gets even more exciting with their Whistler project, offering geographic diversification in south-central Alaska. To find out more about this unique opportunity, please direct your web browsers to brazilresources.com at Yahoo Finance, ticker symbol B-R-I dot V. Remember to ride the exciting gold stock run of 2016 and beyond. Your portfolio will thank you for adding shares of Brazil Resources. Gold Seek employees may or may not own shares. Nothing contained herein should be construed as investment advice. GoldSeek.com Radio. An article in the Mirror this week clearly illustrated the childish hysteria that is being fomented by supposedly rational elected officials. The headline read, Nigel Farage brutally trolled with a he's lying to you sign during his speech about Donald Trump. Nigel Farage is an eloquent, outspoken supporter of Brexit and Donald Trump. Like him or not, his brand of communication is unique and pointed. That, however, is not the issue. The passive-aggressive, childish hysteria that occurred during his speech to the European Parliament is what's at issue. Seb Dance switched seats to sit right behind Farage during his speech to the European Parliament in Brussels and held up a little sign telling viewers, he's lying to you. In a follow-up press release regarding his reasons for holding up the sign, Mr. Dance stated, Mainstream politics must be more willing to challenge the nationalists and the populists. They pretend to stand up for people who are suffering, but their diet is hate, division, and suspicion that creates only misery and poverty. It's time to stop the nuanced language. They're liars. He went on to say, Nigel Farage is regularly treated to free coverage by virtue of being leader of the EFDD, and UKIP often uses these clips in isolation on social media. When debates are time-limited, it is impossible to challenge what he's saying. So I protested in the only way I knew at that point, which was to grab a piece of paper, write a simple message on it, and sit behind Nigel Farage during his usual diatribe. That may be his version of protest, but is that 
really acceptable behavior for a member of an official governing body during an official proceeding. If he were standing behind the queen at an official function, would he dare to do such a thing regarding a disagreement? What if the Speaker of the House or the President of the Senate did such a thing to a U.S. President when he was giving his State of the Union address, or at some other official proceeding? Now, don't get me wrong, I am an advocate for free speech. Mr. Dance clearly felt he was losing the battle in the marketplace of ideas and resorted to what school children often do when they stick a note on some unsuspecting student's back. There are plenty of venues to offer dissenting views. This was not one of them. It will be interesting to see what, if any, fallout occurs as a result of this simple action. Because at an institutional level, it says volumes about the person holding up the note. Exit-style votes have been cast in both the U.S. and the U.K. Disrespect, if tolerated, leads to more disrespect, whether it's Mr. Dance or the CNN reporter who attempted to shout down President Trump at a news conference just before the inauguration. This is the climate of change we currently exist within. If leaders or media who are losing intellectual arguments of the day resort to this kind of unprofessional behavior, the market will judge them, potentially quite harshly. Massive debt that cannot be repaid is the fundamental cornerstone of actions being taken in the U.S. and the U.K., a financial reset is coming, most likely on President Trump's watch. That is the 8,000-pound elephant in the room the media and most commentators refuse to link back to actions being taken today. Most everything you see is a symptom of debt that cannot be repaid and will eventually need to be restructured. And until next time, this is Robert Ian with ConquerChange.com reminding you to follow us on Twitter at ConquerChange. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Robert, thanks for another excellent installment. Well, that wraps up this week's GoldSeek.com radio episode. For two new big guests, be sure to check out next week's show. Until we talk to you again, have a great week. The gold and silver mining sector is red hot. Every investment portfolio needs precious metal shares. Goldseek.com's top stock analysts have done it again, identifying the next solid gold nugget opportunity, Brazil Resources. Based in the eighth largest economy with a mining-friendly reputation, almost 10 million ounces of gold reserves. Industry insiders are accumulating shares of Brazil Resources. The notable management team includes Chairman Amir Adnani, a rising star in the mining industry with a reputation for moving projects rapidly into production. Fortune magazine lists Chairman Adnani in the prestigious list of 40 under 40 ones to watch. Plus, shareholders benefit from the insights and backing of enigmatic Brazilian billionaire Mario Garnero, CEO of Brazil Invest Group, the nation's foremost merchant and investment bank and founding director. Their Sao George project is 100% owned with paved highway access, a nearby workforce, and a hydro